Uh, very good. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Sylvester. Right. Uh, great. Thanks, Mary, and good afternoon, everyone. This is the second of two of these um, kind of introductory workshops, if you will, um, introducing those of you who are not familiar with the Clinical Research Support Office. That's my job. And then I'm going to turn it over to those who join us on the call today and uh, listed here, as well as their picture in the video, Allison Falwell, who's the Research Operations Manager, and C. Joe Thomas, who's our Research Informatics Manager. And this is an effort which is about three years old at this point. Mary Chen and myself um, have been working to create and then evolve this office as a function of maternal child health research. But it's important to point out that everything that you're going to hear is done in partnership with and through the Senior Associate Dean for Research uh, Office. That's Ruth O'Hara and the CTSA Award, which is our large translational award as part of the Trial Innovations Network uh, and the NIH. So with that, um, let's go to the next slide and I'll be right probably for 10, 15 minutes or so an overview of the CRSO, which is listed as the first bullet point here on our agenda. And then, as I said, we're gonna get into some of the specifics of what we do from an operational perspective. Allison is gonna tackle that and particularly share with you um, some of the new offerings, which will become transitioning from uh, currently optional to mandatory as of the spring 2022. And same for CJO, he's gonna walk us through many of the offerings and the progress to date on what we've done with informatics um, with, with embedded in some of the operational systems and some of the things that will be offered increasingly in the coming months as well. Next slide. So we start with this slide. Uh, hopefully those of you who work at Packard or if you work at Stanford, there is a vision 2025 as it were for Stanford Children's Health. And that includes with the blue circle here, breakthrough discoveries. Um, and as part of that, we recognize that there's a need to support research efforts and funding investments, which continue to flow from hospital operations, the foundation, MCHRI itself, as well as the school and funding that is brought by many of the different investigators. So really, we view ourselves by these gears as sitting between several of these entities, which are all interacting, but ultimately acting at the bedside when it involves clinical and translational research. And there was a need to align clinical programmatic excellence and research goals uh, there so that we could remove redundant um, services. We could place in, in, in those areas of the infrastructure and governance where it, was, where it was lacking. And we can improve overall efficiencies and uh, create an accounting for all the School of Medicine, Stanford Children's Health and MCHRI's needs around investments. Because each of these entities, whether it was the school, MCHRI um, and or the foundation and then the, the children's um, hospital actually operational budget is one way or another supporting a heck of a lot of research. And it was um, somewhat um, disparate and hard to audit and keep track of. And so really our office was meant to bring all this into alignment so that we could be more effective in, in um, uh, pursuing this overall uh, mission for supporting breakthrough discoveries. Next slide. So really the fundamental question is, and this goes back probably um, 10 years and certainly longer than that, but it's come into greater focus in the last five and 10 years. And that is, how do we execute a really dramatically expanding clinical and translational patient-oriented research agenda within a healthcare system, specifically in this case, Stanford Children's, which was designed primarily for clinical care. And I think which will become abundantly apparent is that Epic is a great example, pharmacy is another example, clinical labs is another example, radiology is another example where these hospital divisions and services are there first and foremost, as they should be for patient care, but yet we're running a lot of research in alignment with that as we increasingly move towards this culture shift at Stanford Children's where every patient is a potential participant in research. We feel very strongly about being able to offer that service. And so breaking down these barriers between clinical ops and whether that includes informatics under that larger umbrella, um, and research is really at the core of what we're, what we're after. Next slide. So this slide um, addresses just kind of in a schematic way, the challenges facing the research enterprise. Um, the blockers in the red box here at the top are unique to our circumstance. Many of these we have been addressing or have addressed or are in flight. And then the arrows in the boxes at the bottom is true of pretty much any uh, research intensive healthcare system. It's just that we've tweaked it here to be specific to, to, to Stanford Children's. And I think um, we're going we're to hit a couple of these by both Allison and CJ when we get to their part of the, the presentation um, this afternoon. And, and you can just read them for yourselves. We'll be providing these slides after the talk, so there's no need to spend too much time in, in trying to understand what each of those meant, means at the, at the moment. Next slide. It's important to understand you know, kind of where we sit in the overall ecosystem of Stanford Children's Health. 
this slide you can build from the bottom. You see that there's three different arms to MCHRI under the directorship of Mary Leonard, co-directors David Stevenson, Tony Orr, and Mary Chen, who's been the executive director. For a long time, there's been teaching and educational program focus. Uh, there's also been strategic partnerships and grants programs, which are extremely robust and growing all the time. And really what's new is what you're gonna hear about this afternoon, which is the Clinical Research Support Office. Now I say what's new, only in that we've been really, um, I guess, become into prime time here in the last year or so as we've expanded uh, in both um, bringing on Allison and, and others um, to our team. CJO has been with us a little bit longer and then the types of things that we're taking on. But we do report up through MCHRI and of course MCHRI, MCHRI leadership reports all the way up to the governing board, which includes the uh, hospital, the, the hospital, the dean, uh, the CEO and president of the foundation. And of course, um, our physician, physician chief, surgeon chief and newly added the senior associate dean for research, Ruth O'Hara, which again, ultimately all research at Stanford, including children's is under her purview as far as patient protection and uh, faculty involvement. Next slide. This is our office in the red box here. Um, I am the medical director, if you will. Mary Chen and I have been partnering together for over a decade on a variety of things. And then again, this really became a new endeavor in the last couple of years. It's always a pleasure to work with Mary. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you know Mary already. And she also is an assistant dean in the dean's office, also partnering with me on executing the CTSA and, and much of what we do with it, Sierra. So meets the needs of that grant and involving us not only internally in executing um, studies and grants, but also with a national uh, facing efforts so that we can intake requests and connect those to the appropriate investigators and, and systems here. Um, I've already kind of said is that because we're within MCHRI and we're maternal child health, we also have a reporting relationship to David Stevenson, who's the Senior Associate Dean for Maternal Child Health. And as I've already mentioned, Ruth O'Hara is the Senior Associate Dean for Research for all of Stanford Healthcare. Next slide. Um, our mission is to serve as a resource uh, for everyone and anyone involved with research, physician, nurse, allied health researchers. But in addition, perhaps what's unique is also hospital departments and service lines in the School of Medicine, where again, they were largely built as appropriate with governance and reporting structures that were unilaterally to hospital administration. And so we're providing that bridge to research um, as part of the mission for not only Vision 2025, but it's also what we do day in and day out at Stanford Children's. Um, and really we're focused on the compliant conduct of um, maternal and pediatric clinical and translational research. We are funded by a number of different sources, as you can see, um, the hospital administration, um, the MCHRI, the foundation, and importantly, what I keep referring to as the CTSA is this NIH grant from NCATS, and that's the grant number there. Ruth O'Hara is the PI, I'm a co-investigator on that along with Mary Chen. We're all about people at the end of the day, although we involve a lot of technology and process. Next slide. So established in 2018, as I said, kind of maturing here in the last year or two, we're up to four FTEs and we broke down into specific silos. Um, Allison is um, manager and full responsibility for the CRSO operations support, which is the uh, first vertical here. You can read about some of the things that she does. I'm gonna turn it over to her first here in a few slides to walk us through some of the um, uh, efforts and, and ongoing things that may be of interest to you uh, around research process improvement. Informatics will be next. We'll then hand off to Sija, who's going to walk us through a lot of the EPIC functionality, which you may or may not be aware of, that really is facilitating on a daily basis that clinical translational research and integrating it ever more closely into patient care. And then finally, we have another number of different offerings, which are typically done in partnership with existing services, like the research participant recruitment. There's a question in the chat about how to reach controls. This is a function of several different routes. You can certainly work through us, but there's also the participant recruitment program, part of the CTSA offering. It's Catherine Connors. We can provide for that website. We also offer a patient outreach um, through uh, my chart at, at Children's as part of an EPIC functionality. We could perhaps speak to that later. Research coordinator support is just a core function of MCHRI. It's under the direction of Mary and Mesa Peta within MCHRI. We also have Grant Wells uh, beginning to develop a program. Some of you have asked about IND support. We certainly can do that. And we partner with School of Medicine existing resources, but if there's customization or specific questions around maternal and child uh, support for drug device development, particularly when it comes to regulatory requirements, Grant Wells is your guy and he's a function of our office, although he's not on the call today actually because he's meeting with the FDA. And then biostatistical support is offered. Um, if you're a member of MCHRI, you get a couple free hours and consultations through the QSU, which is a school of medicine function, also a CTSA function. And, as, and accordingly, we have access to that. So QSU is a quantitative sciences unit. Okay, and you can see that you know, various stars and asterisks here are, are how we um, leverage the, ver the variety of funding sources across the organization. Next slide. 
So this has really been, um, I would say a game changer. Again, I, I've pointed out that one of the unique aspects of our office is that we partner very closely with hospital administration. We don't just view ourselves because you can't be effective of just being on the school side or on the MCHRI side. And so the bridge to Stanford Children's Health through the hospital administration and those leaders depicted here, including Rick Mason, Denny Lund, Jesus Sapero, Ed Kapetsky, Natalie Pagler, Kathy Bradley, Rishi Sheff, uh, Grace Lee, Annette Nasser. Um, uh, I think that's a complete. And then of course, myself, Mary Leonard, Mary Chen, and we've added Virginia Wynn for the maternal health aspect to this. We meet on a, a monthly basis, either virtually or uh, with paper updates. And importantly, what this group has uh, allowed us to do is they've endorsed us as the channel through which all clinical and translational research activities involving hospital resources are managed. So if it's a bed, um, if it's a need in pharmacy for a drug to be prepared, um, if you're thinking about how am I going to get a blood draw through clinical lab and or, and, or how can I prepare pathology for some uh, services I'm going to need related to my grant, we have the ability to plug that in and speak, if you will, on behalf of the hospital and how that would be adjudicated, governed, and, and in some cases paid for. And providing, therefore, back to the hospital administration strategic direction on where are the needs that we discover in talking to folks on the front line, either they are the hospital personnel or school of medicine faculty and, and coordinators. And then finally, really importantly, the authority to execute is just go and get these things done after we decide on priorities. Now, we're a small team, as you can see, so we can't do everything. But the team, uh, Allison and CJ, we're going to walk you through some of our, I guess, um, wins to date as a, after I summarize. And then we're going to get even deeper into details. And of course, any of the team members are available to you um, following today's workshop to give even greater detail and to explore with you if you have a unique need that we have not yet touched on. Next slide. Okay, this is the fish diagram. We actually started with this, and this was a skinny fish at one time or another. You can see the bones here lead out or pop out to the various different domains. They're numbered one through 10. Um, it goes from left to right, study initiation to study completion. And what this really tells you, and again, the, the details aren't necessarily important on this slide, is, is that it takes a lot of things which are all linked to come together to actually execute your clinical studies. And what this really is meant to say is, is that it's before you actually complete uh, or get awarded, we want you to be thinking about this and be in contact with us. Allison is going to present an intake portal, which will ask you a series of questions, direct you to a variety of, of people who will be able to help you with understanding what some of these hidden costs or needs will be so that you're not surprised once the notice of award comes or you're, con or you're in contracting with a variety of other vendors. Um, we've color coded it just to kind of demonstrate progress to date. The green is actively being addressed and the, the purple is resolved or mitigated. mitigated. What it speaks to is, is that once we started digging into, let's say, box one or box three, we found that it actually affects box two or box five. So all these things are related. You really have to take a holistic view of study flow once in system. And so the earlier we begin to think about this, the better, which is our main take home message to you today. And Allison is going to present the intake portal as our means of helping you do that. So the one place, if you remember nothing else, where to go uh, to, in order to get you started. And of course, we're available to help you with all of that. Next slide. Major accomplishments, um, you know, even before uh, COVID hit, we were looking at secure EPIC processes for research monitors. What this means is that rather than having to come on site, if you're a monitor for, for example, an investigational new drug, you can now do this remotely through EPIC access, which is provided um, in a secure fashion. Of course, this was paramount of importance during COVID. And really it's gonna be a carry on post COVID because it's a more effective and efficient way of doing that. Um, Allison has led, at, along with CJ, a tremendous effort in training uh, hospital uh, personnel and school of medicine in various safety and emergency preparedness. Remember, we're talking about people who are either employee of the, of the hospital, and therefore you have a, a, a set number of things that you're trained in or you're an employee of the school, and yet we come together at the patient bedside, whether you're more oriented towards patient care or research, if it involves research, you really, and it's in Packard, then, then you have to be trained in both of these things, and, and the team can provide a checklist of those types of activities. I mentioned or alluded to already that there's a tremendous number of Epic functionalities, which were specifically built by the company, uh, the vendor, in this case, Epic, which have proven to be of incredible um, efficiency in uh, being led by CJO and rolling those out. And that's an ongoing process and includes things like registering patients, recording adverse events, billing, and scheduling. And as I keep alluding to is the uh, one to fourth star here, developed the Stanford Children's Hospital intake process and repository for all new studies. This is going to help on the front end and getting you plugged in. It's going to help on the back end, us in auditing and keeping track of all patients and studies that are ongoing or in flight from, for auditing and reporting purposes going forward. 
Uh, when I say auditing, I don't mean we're going to come and knock on your door. Uh, only in rare circumstances, we are not the research police. We always like to say we're here as um, as, as assistants and facilitators. And typically, when we discover a problem, it's really just to, to come back to you and, and solve it together, not to, to blow the whistle on anyone. Next slide. So with that, um, I think, Allison, is this where I turn it over to you? It is. Yep. Okay. So Allison, who I've already kind of alluded to and who's our manager for all things research ops, um, joined us about, I guess it's going on almost two, two and a half years at this point. But uh, Allison, take it away. Thanks, Dr. Sylvester. Um, so I'm going to cover a couple of uh, research operations resources available through the Clinical Research Support Office um, today, and then I'll hand it over to CJO to talk about research informatics resources. Um, so we'll cover sponsor monitor access to EPIC, which um, Dr. Sylvester just touched on, um, some of the infection safety and emergency preparedness training that's now required for clinical research staff, uh, the research intake portal, and then some additional examples of the type of um, things we can help with. Um, so as Dr. Sylvester mentioned, um, historically there wasn't a mechanism to provide um, your sponsor monitors with uh, remote access to Stanford Children's Health EPIC. Um, we had a really great process for providing them access if they were on site um, on campus. But once COVID hit, um, most of the monitoring um, was shut down since monitors weren't able to travel to campus and access um, EPIC for monitoring purposes that way. So um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we um, worked really closely with privacy, hospital privacy, uh, HIMSS IS, um, HIMSS Ops, IS Security, and several other teams to figure out how we could make remote uh, access to EPIC possible for research monitors so that um, study monitoring could continue. Um, the kind of net net of that is that we now have a process, a uh, new process for providing access to Stanford Children's Health EPIC for your sponsor monitors. Um, this process um, applies whether your monitor is uh, on site on campus or if they're remote. Um, we can provide access for up to two monitors per visit. Um, we have made our tools and workflows available to others, um, included in their working on the adult side to implement something similar. Um, and to date, we've had 192 monitor visits completed. Um, there's more information on our website, um, and we have a pretty detailed SOP, but we're available for questions. Um, if you know you have a monitoring visit coming up and know that your monitor is going to need access. What's really neat about this is that we can provide access to the patient um, charts, the participant charts for your research study um, for monitors for up to two weeks. Um, so that allows plenty of time um, for monitors to finish their monitoring visit, if you will. Um, this next resource is one um, that we spent quite a long time working on. Um, the background is that there is an LPCH non-employee compliance policy. And basically what that policy says is um, that anybody who's coming into the hospital, um, but who's not an employee, but is acting or providing services on behalf of the hospital um, needs to complete a certain set of trainings and have certain documentation in their personnel file. Um, and to date, um, until about a year ago, there just there wasn't really good awareness of this policy, and the hospital didn't have a really good way to track the clinical research staff from the School of Medicine side who were coming in to the units or the departments um, and interfacing with, with patients and families to make sure that the clinical research staff um, really were protected um, and had all of the um, emergency preparedness and infection prevention trainings. So we worked over the course of about a year with HR and um, information security, um, both on the School of Medicine side with HRG and with um, hospital HR to figure out, all right, what training, when we onboard a new employee in the hospital, what are the trainings they have to take? And when we onboard a new uh, employee in the clinical research job family on the school side, what are the trainings they have to take? And let's figure out where there are equivalencies and where there are gaps. And kind of the, the, what we came away with was that for clinical research staff who either come into Stanford Children's Health facilities or who interact with Stanford Children's Health patients by email or on the phone, there are four critical trainings that are really required, um, both to protect 
the, the clinical research staff, but also to protect patients and families. Um, and these are the four trainings listed here. They're all done through the hospital's health stream system. Um, and they cover really important things like when you're coming up to a patient room and there's a um, picture on the door that indicates there are certain types of precautions, for example, droplet precautions. Um, what does that sign mean and what PPE do you have to wear in order to go into that room and what's the right order in which to put on and take off that PPE? If there's a um, fire uh, or a fire drill, what is the protocol for evacuating horizontally versus vertically? Um, and these sorts of kind of really important safety uh, topics um, are now able to be provided for clinical research staff. Um, and so we've been working um, with different departments and divisions to provide this training. It's done once a year um, and you have 30 days to complete it. So um, many of you on the, on the call have already done it. Um, if you have new members joining your team or if your team has not had this training yet, just please reach out to us and we'll set you up with accounts in Stanford Children's Health um, health strain system and get you um, set up with this training. And to date, we've had 161 school of medicine staff trained, which is really exciting. Okay, the last um, big thing I'm gonna touch on is the, as Dr. Sylvester um, mentioned, the clinical research intake portal for the hospital. Um, we recognize that there are a lot of intake systems between e-protocol and Encore um, and to date, there hasn't been a system um, for the hospital to make the hospital aware of new clinical trials that are coming uh, into the hospital are gonna be touching Packard patients. So we designed this portal to connect, primarily to connect study teams to the designated research liaisons in all of the departments in the hospital. This is the official mechanism through which um, study teams inform the hospital about forthcoming research studies. Um, it's a simple red cap data entry form it's designed not to be duplicative of all the information you're already putting into other systems. We worked really hard not to make this um, redundant, but to really collect the information that the hospital needed, which is in large part pretty different from the information that, for example, is going into e-protocol. Um, and it's also done, um, as Dr. Sylvester mentioned, really far upstream um, to help inform budget development and contract negotiation. Um, for the clinical research teams, rather than reaching out for you all, rather than reaching out to pharmacy and reaching out to radiology and biomedical engineering individually and providing each of them with a copy of the protocol and your IRB approval letter, you come into this system and you provide it one time and that information is automatically sent to the hospital departments that you need to work with. Um, and it provides those departments with the information they need in order to assess the feasibility of your study so that when they meet with you, they already have a lot of the information they need and, and you can have a productive conversation. We went live about um, 14 months ago, and again, the, really the intent was to recognize hospital operational and informatics needs early during study design that historically may not have been fully recognized until the study started, um, when there was often then kind of a scramble to figure out how to make the study work in the clinical setting. Um, Historically, many hospital departments and units, um, despite best intentions by study teams, didn't hear about um, new clinical trials that required their support until after the grant was funded or the contract was signed, and in some cases not before you know, right until the first patient was ready to be enrolled. So um, we created this system to allow the hospital to determine operational feasibility, for to allow them to plan for staffing and training. For example, if your study requires a different nurse to patient staffing ratio than is typically provided on that unit, this allows the um, nurse leadership on that unit to prepare for that. Um, it allows the hospital to build costs into your study budgets when it's appropriate, and it allows us to have a database of clinical trials um, that are active at Stanford Children's Health. Um, on the right, you can see all the departments that are currently in the portal. Um, some of them are hospital departments at Packard. Some of them are shared services like research recruitment or clinical labs um, through which we facilitate um, connecting the the clinical teams with these teams, or the clinical research teams with these teams. We have a couple um, departments and centers that are in the pipeline and that we're working with to bring into the portal, including the Heart Center, uh, Social Services, which includes international medicine um, and nursing. 
And then as of today, we have 112, actually just as of this morning, it's 113 um, new clinical trials that have been submitted since the portal went live 14 months ago. This represents 35 different school of medicine departments and divisions. Um, and on the right are the counts of the hospital services that are requested um, as part of those clinical trials. So this is giving us and the leadership of the hospital some really great visibility into the serv hospital services that are needed to help support your clinical trials. Uh, the last slide before I hand it over to Sijo is um, in addition to what I already talked about, um, additional ways we can be helpful to you. Um, if your faculty um, or for faculty who are on the call, if you require a letter of support from hospital leadership for your grant applications, we can help facilitate getting that um, signed. Um, if your study has a clinical activity for which the CPT code and pricing is not in the workbook, we can um, help you get to the right code for that clinical activity for your study budget. Um, if you need to work with a hospital department or unit that's not currently in the portal, um, we can help you connect with the right team. Um, for example, in the if you need to work with the perioperative area, um, which is one that came to us recently, we can help connect you to the right leaders in that area um, to talk about how to make your trial um, work smoothly. And then if you have new um, team members or um, faculty, we're happy to come provide an overview um, of research resources for those folks. We also are always really interested to hear about um, services that you need or um, challenges that you're experiencing with which we can help. So if there's something in addition to what we've covered today, please just feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're happy to, to do whatever we can to help. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sijo. Hello all. <clears throat> thank you, Alison. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, go through some of the details on uh, clinical research informatics and uh, what we are doing in that area. Uh, so this shows some of the summary. So let's go to the next slide. So, you know, clinical, many of you might have heard about clinical informatics, but clinical research informatics is basically supporting the translational research at the hospital setting. Uh, so we have a big IT IES support team at the School of Medicine side uh, and uh, IES team at the Packard side. So I am part of uh, Packard IS, uh, and uh, basically our goal is to uh, from CRSO standpoint to support clinical research activities happening at the hospital side. And I closely work with School of Medicine IS department, IT department. So in this slide, you can see the clinical research informatics means it is uh, sharing big health data and uh, creating a learning health system, improving research workflows, clinical research workflows, and uh, facilitating interdisciplinary team science. Uh, so this is our goal. These are our goals, and uh, as you can imagine, all the healthcare data is getting created at the hospital side. So it is very important that we transfer it to the school side, uh, you know, to initiate uh, AI studies or uh, other uh, machine learning initiatives. And so there are a lot of aspects we can do uh, to harness this data along with uh, facilitating the clinical research at the school, hospital setting. Next slide. So uh, we had extensive conversations with uh, hospital privacy and regulatory uh, on what should be in EPIC related to clinical research, <clears throat> because uh, all of you know about CTMS, Clinical Trial Management System, and uh, Stanford has Encore. Many of you are using Encore, and there, there was always a confusion where the documentation should go, should it be in EPIC or should it be in Encore? So we worked with, uh, this slide is coming from EPIC and it shows you know, the coexistence of Encore and EPIC. It is very important to have both systems in place and working together. Uh, and we talked with the hospital privacy and regulatory department to come up with our policies at the children's hospital site, what should be in EPIC and should not be in EPIC. And also we collaborated with HIMSS department to ensure that the right information related to the research is stored in the appropriate way in EPIC, uh, you know, so that uh, when there is medical legal request for the data, uh, up, you know, the research related things are filtered out. 
So there are a lot of activities surrounding this documentation, uh, what is an EPIC, and uh, we worked on this and uh, where we have a uh, clear guidelines from the regulatory department on this. Next slide. So uh, uh, I already mentioned that uh, my role uh, on behalf of uh, CRSO is uh, facilitating the clinical research support at the hospital setting. And you can see that uh, each uh, encounter the patient is having at the hospital each step of the encounter, if the patient is a research patient, study patient, there are things that needs to be done uh, for the right billing and for the right documentation. That means uh, there is an opportunity to call out the appointment as a research appointment. Uh, you know, research coordinators can schedule and register patients as needed or should be able to do that and notes and documentation to indicate that it is a research note or documentation. Orders can be associated with the research studies. Uh, the concerns, whether it should be stored in EPIC or not. You know, results, should you be getting a notification on results? So there are a lot of uh, steps in that patient life cycle in the hospital, or like, you know, from patient entering into the hospital and discharging from the hospital. There are so many things that we are able to support, and there are so many things you should be doing mandatory uh, to ensure the right billing and also ensure the right documentation. And everything add up to research charge review. If you do all these steps in the right way, that means you can see at the end, the charge review is going to be much easier. And we are working on an integration with the on-call system, as you can see at the upper side of this slide. We are working, uh, hopefully in the near future, there will be the study information and the billing grid will flow from EPIC on core to EPIC. Uh, so currently you are sending the workbook to Sydney uh, that is going to remain in place until this integration happens in the near future. Let's go to the next slide. So this is about the billing review. We have, uh, uh, we are approved by the leadership or we are uh, instructed by the leadership to complete EPIC billing review transition within a couple of months time. Uh, all of you are used to doing this in PDF. PFS used to, patient financial services used to send it a PDF document. You used to scan, print it out, mark it, scan it, send it back but it, it can be done in EPIC and uh, uh, the hospital leadership wants this to be completed in a couple of months time. We have started training. Many of the departments are already doing this in EPIC and the rest of the people who are still to get the training invite, they will be getting it soon in the next couple of months. Uh, from the March next year, it is going to be mandatory that everybody do this in EPIC not in PDF. And when, when I say mandatory, I'm sure people are going to appreciate that because people love doing this in EPIC instead of doing this in a PDF. Uh, and uh, the importance is that hospital is holding the bills until you do the review, the research team. So there could be multiple millions of dollars getting held pending coordinator review. So when you do this in EPIC, this gives a better visibility for the leadership and we are able to request the teams to clear the bills faster. So there are multi benefits for uh, all the stakeholders in this process. Let's go to the next slide. So many of you know that we started uh, EPIC uh, enrollment a couple of years back. Uh, all of you, whoever are the research coordinators in this webinar already enrolling the patients in EPIC. They are doing the encounter linking in EPIC. And you can see this page, this screenshot at, of a test patient in EPIC. You can see there are a lot of things now, many of the teams are doing already in EPIC. People are documenting adverse events, especially oncology studies. You can have a data capture form uh, and you can fill up the task. And the, the last one that I have highlighted here is clinical pipe. That is an application that you can use to send the data to your EDC system automatically. So instead of uh, 
manually typing the patient information into your EDC system. Our oncology team uh, requested the implementation of this system so that they can transfer the data to Genentech EDC. Uh, they are going to start using that this hopefully by January once they have a patient enrolled in the study. So you can see that this research page is becoming very important in EPIC. And it also gives a very good visibility for the research, uh, for the clinicians, what is happening with, with that patient. And that is very important for the coordination between research teams and the clinical teams. Let's go to the next slide. So a lot of EPIC functionalities, many of you are using this already, or we, are, we have started supporting it. For example, with search orders, our coordinators are now pending the orders in EPIC. Uh, that was a big effort we did uh, working with the regulatory department. We got the approval. Now coordinators are able to pen the orders. They are able to schedule the patients, register patients in EPIC. They are able to get appointment notifications or appointment cancellation notifications. All these functionalities we enabled, and you can see the lot of functionalities here. Most of them, 99% in this list is enabled except the study consent in EPIC uh, because we will start uh, rolling out probably electronic consents and all in the future once EPIC releases that functionality. Uh, but there are some limited study consent functionality now. We are working on it to enable it. But if you see something that you want to make use of, please let me know and uh, we can uh, follow up on that. We can discuss about it. But otherwise, many of these are standard. Uh, many of the teams are already working with me on this. Let's go to the next slide. So this is a slideshow. I, uh, you know, just some animations I wanted to show how this uh, whole picture, how is, uh, you know, uh, earlier this was the situation in the past, like everything was in paper. You can see that you used to send the workbook to Sydney. And then when you enroll a patient, you send the enrollment information in an Excel sheet to PFS. Then you get the PDF uh, to review. This was a research coordinator's relationship with EPIC in the past. That said, everything in paper, they never used to do anything in EPIC. But we changed uh, it a lot uh, under CRSO. So we started recruitment through my chart. Uh, I will come to that in the next slides. We started ADT events, notifications for the research teams, appointment change notifications, a lot of other things that is listed there. All this started when research coordinators started enrolling patients in EPIC because you cannot wait for PFS to enroll after two days or something. You have to enroll it immediately so that system knows this patient is associated with the research study and system can enable all these functionalities after that. Uh, so then you can see note entry. We created a note type called research note type. Uh, we are letting coordinators associate the orders to the study so that uh, the billing will be streamlined when you when, when you associate an order to the study, that bill generated out of that order, if it is an echocardiogram order, that will go to the research bucket. So it will be easy to do the review. And we enabled research monitoring, remote research monitoring by sponsor. We worked with the privacy to get whole chart access for the monitor. It was uh, not allowed in the past, if you guys remember. Not even remote monitoring was allowed and also only small part of the charts were allowed to be released, but now it is whole chart. Uh, so the whole ecosystem you can see here uh, developing, uh, yeah, if you click one more time, when the CTMS comes, you can see that Encore will be sending that the study information to EPIC. The billing protocol will be sent from Encore to EPIC. So there will be a seamless integration between Encore and EPIC in the future. And we are all set for that. Uh, basically, as you can see on the right side, almost all other functionalities we have rolled out in EPIC. Uh, the billing review transition will be complete in next two months. 
uh, so you know basically we are all set uh, and we are ready to work with each of your teams and uh, your needs uh, each study needs are different so the, that may need some kind of conversation if you need something specific related to the study uh, and we are always building order sets uh, research uh, bpas best practice alerts and those kind of things uh, that is standard and we always do that let's go to the next slide so this is what I mentioned about the research recruitment support. Uh, there is a research participation service at uh, Stanford and uh, CRSO collaborate with the service. Uh, so you should approach this service directly. And if you are planning to send notifications or uh, invitations, research invitations through my chart, uh, Epic on the Epic side, we support it but your access point or entry point is uh, Catherine uh, who lead this program. And uh, then she ensure that you have the right IRB and all the other things. And she connect you to us. And uh, we complete that process of sending the notif you know, invitations uh, to the my chart. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, we started this for many studies. This data is a little old, uh, but you can see that uh, the percentage of uh, response we are getting. So if you if you see the fifth column, you can see that 20% uh, of uh, people are reading the messages. And uh, the sixth column shows percentage of read and responded. So that means if they are reading, 33% is responding out of those who read it. And the percentage of interested is 4%. So that means if you have a study that requires like thousand patients to be registered, probably this is the way to go uh, because you can send the messages to 50,000 patients and you can tailor it. Like, you know, you can look for the patients who had an encounter in the last year uh, or something like that. And you can set different criteria. So the research participation services help you to do all of those. And you just, uh, uh, you know, plan this outreach uh, on a recurrent basis. You may want to schedule it like 100 patients each in a week or something like that. So uh, you get ample time to uh, work on the, you know, uh, uh, logistics like enrolling those patients and all. So, uh, you know, let us know if you have any questions, happy to work with you and also reach out to uh, Catherine uh, in research participation services or you can reach out to us. Let's go to the next slide. So these are the, some of the other things what we are doing uh, in coordination with school. As you can see, learning the health system, yeah, you know, learning health system, uh, that process is very tedious. It is very easy to say, that we want to learn and put the processes together, but all this data that is getting generated nowadays, you know, handling the data, ensuring that the right people get access to the right kind of data, all this need a lot of uh, coordination between school and hospital. So we are uh, trying to connect to both packet IS and school IT teams uh, and uh, enable this transition, uh, you know, from hospital to school and back. Uh, and uh, many of these stakeholders are uh, at different places in Stanford Enterprise. Uh, they probably don't even know each other, some of these parties. Uh, so it is very important to connect them, bridge them and work with them to enable this learning health system. Let's go to the next slide. So this is one of our mode of cooperation with the uh, School of Medicine. Uh, you probably, most of you know that uh, uh, School of Medicine IT and Adult Hospital IT merged, but uh, Children's IT decided to stay separate. But what we did, we created a committee uh, to, you know, that job, that meets every month with School of Medicine, uh, this TDS, Joint Entity TDS Technology and Digital Services. So we meet every month to discuss the plans and uh, operationalizing it. So there is a very good coordination between Packard IS and uh, TDS technology digital services, which includes research IT and the adult side IT. 
so uh, you know dr silvester uh, chairs that committee and uh, we have uh, all the right representation from both school side and the children's uh, is side let's go to the next slide so i will uh, let mary summarize it uh, but uh, please let us know if you have any questions or follow-ups Thanks, see Joe. Thanks, Allison. So um, Carl had to head off to clinic. So normally he would summarize uh, the final thoughts, but I'll just go through this real quick on his behalf. Um, as you can see from the presentation so far, I mean, um, a lot of the problems that we have been trying to solve are quite complex. And we have found that through direct engagement with all the different stakeholders and with both hospitals, the school of medicine, um, university, SADR office, um, that really is the best way for us to start to tackle some of these uh, complex issues that have been around for years and years, uh, especially for those of you who have been at Stanford for a long time. Uh, and the take home message is that we really hear the CRSO is a resource for all of you, for our departments and faculty in the School of Medicine, for all the staff and clinical teams and providers at Stanford Children's Health, uh, because it is our joint mission to support research innovation here. Um, and so that, that really is our take home. And our last slide before we go to questions uh, is just our contact information. There's a general inquiries email, CRSO at stanfordchildrens.org. Um, our informatics team, CJO, uh, who uh, leads that effort. And also we um, have Trisha Ning, who's uh, our newest member of CRSO, our informatics analyst, and then, of course, our operational support, um, Allison Falwell, who's our uh, clinical research operations manager, and that's her contact there. So with that, I think we shall go to questions. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand if you want to just ask it directly um, or type it in. We did have a couple of pre-submitted questions. So, um, Let's see, there is a question. Um, so yeah, so Neda, if you could um, go ahead and put those two questions so that everybody can see, um, uh, the attendees can see. So the two submitted questions are number one, um, we'd love to learn more about research registry and school-wide opportunities, opportunities for um, healthy control recruiting. And I think I'm going to direct that to see Joe. And I think Catherine Connors is on the call as well, uh, who uh, may be able to chime in as well. So CJ, I'll turn it over to you for now. Yeah. So uh, research registries, uh, there are a lot of activities happening uh, about, yeah, about it. One is we have created a registry work group at Packard. And uh, Dr. Grace Lee is the chair of that uh, work group. The goal is that most of the research registries, you are storing the data at the school side and all the activities are happening at the school side. So you definitely need an IRB and all those things. But you need the data to come from hospital, uh, right? Uh, so sometimes you want the real-time data or sometimes you want the data has to be captured in EPIC so that you can translate that into your registry in RedCap. So we are... Uh, guiding the teams in all these processes. Uh, please reach out to me and I can connect you with the right parties. Uh, we have a registry manager at the packet side and we work with our IT and RedCap team. We are working on developing a connection between EPIC and RedCap, uh, an API connection, so that you can push the data from EPIC to RedCap. But this is not ready. Uh, we are working on it. Maybe it will be ready in next uh, you know, it, it, it got sidelined because of all the COVID related issues and all. Uh, but so feel free to reach out to me uh, directly on that. And I'm happy to connect you with the right parties and guide you on that. Mm -hmm. And then just the second part of that question about uh, healthy control recruiting. Um, we do partner very closely with the recruitment services uh, program led by Catherine Connors in the SADR office in School of Medicine. Um, and so um, feel free to reach out to her as well. Um, and then um, I had Allison show this slide again, uh, just to answer. Thank you, Catherine. So there's the um, a resource there. And if you uh, have more questions about that, please uh, reach out to Catherine Connors. 
Um, and then the second question um, that was submitted earlier was about offering FDA and IND filing and reporting. And Carl mentioned this a little bit about the drug and device development support and training program, uh, which you see here on the right column there, led by Grant Wells from MCHRI. So he's a great resource for any needs that you might have uh, when it comes to drug and device development. Um, and we can, let's see, perhaps Netta, you can put the D3 um, website there for everybody as well. Thank you. Okay, and then um, I'll just wait a couple more minutes in case there are also other questions. But just as a reminder, um, we did mention in the beginning, uh, for those of you who didn't uh, hear this part, a CRSO mailing list. And uh, it's an opt-in mailing list. And all we're gonna use it for is to let people know about future sessions that we're gonna hold. We are planning to hold these sessions roughly every quarter. So we're looking for February, 2022 as our next session. Uh, so if you sign in, we'll make sure that you get updates on when those might be. When the recording for these sessions go on the website, you'll also be notified uh, in case you wanna watch it again or send it to a colleague. Um, and if there are any resource updates or any epic functionalities, for example, that might you know, be turned on or any training opportunities and news like that, we'll be using that uh, mailing list. So, uh, and that is in the chat there. So you can go ahead and sign up if you're interested. And I'm just looking to see if there are any other questions. Okay. Any last thoughts, Allison or C. Joe? Anything else you guys want to mention? No, good, okay. Well, we'll give everybody five minutes back. Thanks so much everybody for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great rest of your Wednesday and the rest of your week. Thank you, bye. Bye everyone.